Okay, so welcome to our cost um, MI class. We are treating costing method, process costing part one. In process costing, we are going to be looking at manufacturing concern. We are going to be seeing a manufacturing process going on. We are going to see following situations whereby we have normal losses occurring when you do manufacturing. So it means that you manufacture, let's say bread. Uh -oh, just a moment, we get lights. Okay, so let's say you make bread and you put some ingredients called materials. There are certain losses that you are expected to get, which is called a normal loss. Or you're making soap, or you're making perfume. You put in some ingredients, and you get out certain, certain, certain expected product. There are some losses you are expected to make. It's called the normal loss. Now, when the loss goes beyond what is normal, the excess becomes abnormal loss. Sometimes you may be surprised that instead of making that normal loss, you are making less than the normal loss than what you expected. And so you made abnormal gain. We'll be discussing all that. Then we'll be looking at when there is a closing work in progress. How do you deal with that? Then when we have an opening work in progress and we deal with it in a method called the weighted average method. Then there's another one called the FIFO method. After we've dealt with opening and closing work in progress, we will now combine them with losses. Then we'll look at joint products and byproducts. These are the things we stand to get in our process costing today. Now, process costing is a system where you find any of these characteristics. The output is continually produced in the manufacturing process. So they are producing that thing always. Sometimes it's measured in kilograms, measured in tons or in liters or in tins. For example, tomatoes. It's measured in tons, measured in liters, measured in kg, measured in tins. It's continually being produced. Now, another characteristic you can find is that at the beginning of the process, all the materials you need, perhaps to make that bread or to make that tin tomato, would have been added at the beginning. But at each stage in the process, labor is added as at when due. Okay, let's say you are making bread at the milling stage where they will put all the ingredients and mix them together. Material will be 100%, but the labor for making the bread may just be 20% complete at that department. Then it enters another department where they cut it and put it in the, um, in the pan. They put the dough in the pan where it is left to rise. Maybe 
perhaps about 50% of the labor would have been worked on it. Then we have the bakers who will not take the bread, throw it into the oven. After some times, they harvest it. Perhaps at that time, 70 or 80% of the whole labor has been applied. It is now left in the cooling room. That's another process. And the cooling room, we cool it, the slicers will come, run it in a machine, slice it, and package it into the finished packaging. That is when the products would have been fully completed and 100% of labor would have been applied. So you see, it is easy to distinguish between material, direct material, and every other thing involved in making that bread successful. Just a moment, let me off this light. All right. So in process costing, we separate or we usually distinguish between direct materials. So normally we say direct materials on the one hand, then this is because it is the material at the start that is making the products what the product is at the end. Now the labor and the production overhead are what we call conversion. This is the effort used in converting the direct material into the finished product. Another characteristic is that as you are converting the materials, the direct materials to final outputs, there might be some losses due to evaporation or chemical reaction. Let's say you are making perfume. And so you put maybe 20 liters of ingredients, direct material. They are all liquid. And let's say due to the chemical process, one liter got evaporated and your final output is 19 liters. So losses could be experienced during the manufacturing process. It's allowed. So the system allows for expected losses. The expected losses could be calculated and you will know how many you are expected to, to loss. So if it goes above that, it is not abnormal loss. Okay. Now, when there is continuous production, at the end of the year, we find out that, let's say December 31st, we find out that there are some, we are using bread as an example. There are some bread that have not been fully packaged because when you put them in the company's package, when it, whenever a product is ready to be sold, that is when it is a finished product. But if it, if it is not in the form where it can be sold, it is still work in progress. Let's say the bread, some of them have been put out, put in the oven and are, and are out of the oven. And some of them are in the cooling room, cooling and waiting to be sliced. They may be 80% complete in conversion and 100% complete in material. So sometimes it is difficult to measure the quantity of work in progress at the end of the period. So we use what we call equivalent units. What it means is that how many incomplete products is equivalent to one complete product. So that's what we're going to use. And we are going to be using the percentage of completion method 
you see how we apply it. Another characteristic is the output from process one becomes the input of process two. The output of process two may also become the input of process three. Okay. So these are some of the characteristics we see in process custom. All right. Now let's look at a simple process cost. We are going to be using a particular simple process costing to illustrate what we are saying. Now look at this. If you look at this process costing, on the debit side of the process cost account, the debit side, that is where you have your cost of production. Your cost of production is divided into material costs and conversion costs. So we call the conversion cost. Conversion cost has labor in it and has production overhead. Now, if you look at the columns, there are two columns, the columns for units and the columns for value. In the left-hand side, only the materials must have units. So you see why we are distinguishing materials from conversion, because it is the materials at the beginning that you want to check with the output material. If what you passed in is what you passed out. Okay, so if you look at it now, material has units and it has value. Conversion, you only put the cost of conversion. That means the cost of labor and the cost of overheads. They don't have units. So the total value there is your cost of production. It is not going to be reflected in the output. Now in this case, there are no losses. What you put in the beginning was what you got at the end. And the value of the output is the value oh, on this slide. Okay, sorry for that. So the value at the beginning is going to be the value at the end. And that's straightforward. Let's look at another little complication added to it. The left-hand side remains the same. Material, 100 introduced, conversion, everything gives you one five. But now, you, have not, you now have some losses. It means you put material, what's, let's say, 100 kg, and you now have vested 90%, which is 90 kg out of it, and you lose 10%. The question now is, how do you spread the cost of production? How do you spread the cost of production of one five? Will the costs, will the production costs be spread to the output alone and the loss not being recovered? If the output is spread, if the value is spread on only the good outputs, what it means is that 1,500 divided by 90, it means the output will be valued more than when it was 1,500 divided by 100. This is because you did not recover your losses. But now if you recover your losses, it means that you allocate some cost to the loss and the balance you allocate to your output. So the question is, how much loss should you recover? How much will you put as a value of loss? And how much 
is the value of the output. All it needs is a decision based on management, management decision. Now we'll take it a little bit higher. Let's say there were no losses. The left-hand side is still the same. Let's say there were no losses, but you could only finish 100%, 90 units. And the 10 remaining, you have not finished it. The 10, they have not finished. How do you value your good output, your completed output? Because now there are two types of outputs, completed and incomplete output. What value do you give to each of them? Now, this incomplete output will be discussed later because we are going to use something called the equivalent unit to handle that. Next, we have another complication. Now look at the left-hand side has changed a bit. Now, you have opening work in progress from last period. The others are the same, but the opening work in progress has entered. And now you have closing work in progress and you have your normal output. How do you value this opening work in progress? How do you value it? We we'll say we are going to use two methods to value it, which is the weighted average method or the FIFO method. We'll come to it. Then we'll now have where we now have opening work in progress, closing work in progress, and you have losses. Now that's complete. Now look at the format. The complete format is when you have an opening work in progress, which is either valued, the units here are val and, and value here are used, use the weighted average method or the FIFO method to evaluate it. Then you have your direct material. So anything materials, you put them, you put units. Your direct materials is there. Now this direct labor, direct expense and overhead, these three are grouped together and called conversion. They are now here. Then whenever you have abnormal gain, abnormal gain always goes to the left-hand side of the process account. So there are three or four things that could be in the left-hand side of the process account. Opening stock must be there. Sometimes opening stock may not be there, it may be zero. Direct material will be there, conversion will be there, and if there is abnormal gain, it stays there. In the right hand side, the first thing we have is good output. If there are good outputs, we put it there. Then if there is a normal loss, we put it there. Okay? And now the normal loss as a negative sign, so, so to speak. Anyway, forget about that. We have the abnormal loss. Now that is an extra loss outside a normal loss. Mind you, whenever you have abnormal loss, you cannot have abnormal gain. So anywhere you have abnormal gain, you cannot have abnormal loss. So the two can never be in the same question. So kindness, please, could you off your... Yo, okay. Okay, now. Um, sorry. All right. So this is the formula. Look at the format. So we need to look at this format in the whole sense. And we know what is in the left-hand side. Everything in the left-hand side will give you cost of production. Everything in the right-hand side will give you what is the output. Left-hand side give you cost. 
right hand side will give you output. And mind you, this good output, this good output is um, what goes to the next process. Is what goes to the next process. In the next period, if this were a closing period, in the next period, what goes to the Okay, so let's see what we can do now. They said, in all questions, you need to identify the losses and the output. So that means you need to first of all identify what is your actual output. So you need what is your expected output. When you get your expected output, identify what is your actual output. That will help you to identify how many is loss. And that will also help you to identify if there is abnormal loss or perhaps abnormal gain. After identifying the units of losses and outputs, the next thing to do is to value them. What is the cost of the good output? What is the cost of loss are they going to be recovered or not and if you have work in progress what is their value now use the cost you have calculated to assign values to good output losses and work in progress so this cost we are talking about in the second part here is unit cost unit cost then you just simply use it to multiply the number of units to get the value then you complete your process account so we can be looking at them up till abnormal loss perhaps for today or abnormal gain so the first one is normal loss normal loss is a process whereby you expect that loss will occur and you are expecting it. Let's say you say you are expecting a 10% or a 5% loss. And through to your word, you lost 5%. Now, because of your experience in that business, you know the amount of loss that you are expecting. Now look at the formula for normal loss. Normal loss is equal to quantity of input material minus expected output. Com quantity of input material minus expected output. So we shall be looking at that. We shall be looking at that. Now let's see an example here. You have a you are expecting a normal loss of 10% in a, in a process, manufacturing process. And your input material is 5,000 liters. Since you are expecting a 10% loss, that means you are expecting that 500 liters will be lost. That means 500 liters, if you minus it from 5,000, it means your expected output 
is going to be 4,500. Normal losses are unavoidable in manufacturing process. Give me a moment. Normal losses are expected. If, for example, you buy one liter tin of soup and you must heat the soup, you now heat it, the soup will evaporate, so you cannot avoid it. And so your output will no longer become one liter. It might be something less than a liter. So normal loss would have been evaporated. We see that in chemicals, producing chemicals, perfumes, even sometimes things we eat like tomatoes. I keep using tomatoes. Now look at when there is no recovery value of loss. How do you value loss? Now look at the example of soup. If that one liter of soup costs you 500 naira, and when you cook the soup, when you cook the soup, 10% of it evaporates. You are now left with zero point, which is 90% of that one liter, which is 0 0.9 liters. Now, how do you value the 0 0.9 liters left? Normally, you have already paid 500 naira for one liter. So if the loss is unavoidable and you cannot recover that evaporated loss, you have no doubt or no choice than to value the remaining 0 0.9 liters for 500. So that is what happens whenever your loss have no recovery recoverable value, you cannot recover it. It means the whole good product, the remainder of the good products uh, will take the cost of production, okay? Now, look at what you do to value your good product. Your good product is valued as follows. The total cost process, which is that 500 Naira, divided by the expected units of output, which is 0 0.9. So all you need to do is 500 Naira, total costs divided by the expected units, 0 0.9. That will give you the cost of valuing one good output. Now let's look at this example we'll be using throughout Input quantities, this is the materials you put at the start. That is 2,000 liters. And you are expecting a normal loss of 10%. 10 so it means that when you find a normal loss of 10%, it means that your output, expected output should be 90%, right? So 90% of 2,000, will give you 1,800 liters. That is what you are expecting. Now, if your actual output is the same as your expected output, that is 1,008, 1,008, it means there is no abnormal loss. It means what you expected came to pass. There is no abnormal loss, no abnormal gain. Your direct material cost, it means that 2,000 liters that you put in the beginning, it cost you 3,600. Okay, now your labor, which is your workers you pay to convert and your production overhead is 300, 600. So I will just sum them together and say conversion cost is 900. What do you do? The cost per unit, the cost 
per unit can be calculated this way. Your material cost is 3,006. So that 2,000 units that you bought for 36 plus your conversion cost of 900 will give you total expected cost of 4,500. Now, because that normal loss of 10%, which is 200, have no recoverable value, they have evaporated, so you can't recover them. The remaining 1,800 will share the cost of 4,500. So you simply say 4,500 divided by 1,800. It means your good output will cost you two naira 25 rupu. So what do you do your process account? The process account shows below is a work in progress account for the process. The debit side of the account will record direct material and conversion costs, while the credit side will represent incomplete accounts of finished goods, which is work in progress, plus the finished goods output. It also, the account also includes memorandum quant, quant, and column for quantities. So it does not show only the cost. You show the quantities of input material, the quantities of finished good output, the quantities of work in progress, the quantity of losses. Your normal loss, if it is not recovered, you only have quantity or it will not have value. All right. Now, when there is no recovery, look at how the process account will look like. The input material, you have 2,000 units you put at the beginning, and the material cost you 3.6. Your direct labor and production overhead, these two is combined to so call conversion, cost you 300, 600, which is 900, and the cost of production is four five, two thousand. Now we said your output. We've calculated that the one eight will be valued at two naira fifty kobo each, which will give you four five. That means your loss had no recoverable value. Only the unit is stated there. That two hundred that was lost is given there just to balance the account. You put two hundred at the beginning. You harvested one eight. That means two hundred was lost, and it was not recovered. So it is that share, no recovery, <clears throat> no recoverable value. Now that we've seen losses without recoverable value, it means the output, the good output, will take the share, will share the production costs, and so. When the loss is not recovered, the cost per unit of each output tend to be higher. Now let's see a situation where you can recover the loss. Now that means the, the loss was not evaporated. But let's say um, is let's say it's bread, it's bread that you make. And you know, there are some bread that is so small that it cannot be sold as good product. Or it's so overriced that it cannot be selling that in the market. It's not your standard shape or standard way of selling it. So you cannot cost them the same way that you cost your good product. Let's say it is so small that you cannot sell them as normal price. So you cannot cost them to that normal price. What do you do? You don't throw them away. There are some people who need them. So you sell them at scrap value. So whatever you can recover from that loss at scrap value 
becomes the recoverable value for the loss. Mind you here, the loss did not evaporate as in the first case where there is no value. But here, the loss is still there. You can recover something out of it. Now, how do you value your good product? All you need to do is get the total cost in the process. Now, remove whatever you are going to recover from normal loss from the total cost. That will give you the remainder that will go to the good product. Now, divide it with the expected number of outputs. That will give you your output cost per unit. Let's say an example here, the same example we've been using before. Everything is the same. 200 losses normal, one eight is expected, direct material three six, conversion is one nine, and your direct material 3006 and 19 gives you 45. This is your total process cost. But we are told that the 200 units that was lost, you can recover them at 90 Kobo. 90 Kobo. So 90 Kobo, or is it nine Naira? Okay, I believe it's nine naira. Oh, it's 90 Kobo. It's really 90 Kobo. All right, at 90 Kobo. 90 Kobo multiplied by 200 units of losses will give you 180 naira. So 180 naira can be recovered. So you less that recoverable value from four five, which is the total process cost, you are now left with 4,320, which you now divide with the output expected, one eight. So you can see now your cost per unit has gone down to 2.4, as against 2.5 you used before. And so look at how your process account will be the left hand side will be unchanged, no doubt about that. The right hand side, you see the normal loss now have value, 180. And now the output has reduced per unit to 2.4. When you multiply 180, you have 4,320. As against when it was 25 here, and you are recovering the whole 45 here. So you see, it will be better for you to have your normal loss being recovered so that the value of your output will be lower than when it was not recoverable. Okay, now let's say you have your normal loss. It was not evaporated. It was not evaporated. But the fact is, you can see your normal loss, but you cannot recover anything from it. All you need to do is to throw it away. You want to dispose it, you throw it away. And you spend money in throwing it away, in disposing it. Maybe because um, it's harmful if you keep them. How will you treat it? So what you do now, the cost of good outputs will simply be your total process cost. Plus that cost you're going to spend in disposing that loss. You add them together and divide by the expected number of outputs. That will give you your cost of good outputs. Now see an example here, everything in this account is the same. 200 units will be lost. But we are told that we are not going to recover the 200 units by scrap value. But we are going to dispose them at one naira per liter. So if we dispose them at one naira per liter, it means the whole 200 liters 
will be disposed for 200 naira. So what do we do? Look at the cost of production, four five. We add the disposal costs and it becomes four seven. We now spread the four seven to the good products, 1,800. So you see our cost has increased. This to 2.66111. Why did it increase? Because we have a additional cost of disposal, which increased the cost from 4.5 to 4.7. And now this is how our process accounts will look like. Now the left-hand side has changed a bit. This is a direct material that is your conversion cost. Now we are now adding disposal costs. So even though you are disposing 200, you are not putting the 200 units here. Only the cost you are disposing of, you are spending in disposing. Here is the normal loss. You see, it doesn't have any recoverable value. So there's no way you can dispose your normal loss if it has recoverable value. So if it has recoverable value, you recover it. When it don't have recoverable value, two things may happen. It's either the loss was evaporated, that's why you cannot recover it, you cannot sell it for scrap or recover it, or it didn't evaporate, but you have to dispose it. Let's get to abnormal loss. How do you know that your loss is abnormal? It is when you've made a much higher loss than what you are expecting. The excess is abnormal loss. How do we know abnormal loss? Actual loss minus expected loss. That's abnormal loss. Now let's look at this question. How do we treat abnormal loss, first of all? Now, Abnormal loss is something you are not expecting. So you didn't make any provision for it. Normally, we usually say expected loss and expected units and normal loss should give us the total quantities we put in. And we said the normal loss could be recovered or it may not be recovered. That means if you go much more than your normal loss, you are not touching the normal output. It means the more abnormal losses you make, the lesser your finished output will be. So it means that abnormal loss was supposed to become the finished output if there was no loss, if there was no abnormal loss. So any abnormal loss you make, any one you make will be valued at the cost of good product because you are not expecting it. So your good product will be valued. Let's say the one we valued at 2.5, that is how you will value abnormal loss. The one we valued at 2.4, that is how you are valuing your abnormal loss. Let's look at an example here. Now, input quantities is 2,000. We are expecting a normal loss of 10%. So our expected output is 1.8. And lo and behold, our actual is 1.7. Why? It means what we are expecting is one eight, and but we are actually seeing one seven. The difference hundred is abnormal loss. It means this hundred liters has shortened our output from one eight to one seven. We are going to value this hundred the way we value the one seven because we are supposed to value one eight at the cost of good production. So whatever happens to this one seven, the same will go to this hundred. So what happened now is four five is our cost of production. So now can you see one eight being divided 
is this expected output. Or you can even say actual plus abnormal loss is this one eight. So you have two five. It means this two five is used to value the normal output and the abnormal loss. That two five never affects normal loss. It's your abnormal loss and your good output. Okay, so if you see it here, that's what is happening. You are valuing them at the 2,950 goal. Now look at how your process account will look like. Left hand side remains unchanged, quantity of material and the value on version cost, same as old before. Your output is valued at 250 kobo. Then your abnormal loss is valued at that same 250 kobo. See, your normal loss here has no recoverable value. Here is the point when there is no recoverable value. And look at the double entry process. You debit the normal account, abnormal account, abnormal loss account, and you credit the process account. Okay, now when there is a recoverable value for normal loss, what do you do? When loss has a scrap value, the scrap value of the normal loss is going to be deducted from the process cost like we normally do. Then the result is divided by the expected units of output. Then we will now value the cost of good production to the normal output and to the normal loss. Why and to the abnormal loss? Why the normal loss will take its recoverable value? Okay. Let's see if we have an example. Yes, we do. Same thing. Input quantity is the same. We have an abnormal loss of 100. And we are told the scrap value of the normal loss is 0 0.9 Naira. 90 Kobo. That's 90 Kobo. What do we do? The materials are still the same. We are supposed to get 4.5. But when we now remove 200, naira, 200 units of loss, normal loss, minus, um, times 0 0.9, that will give you one naira, 180 naira. So your process cost has reduced to 4,320, which we use to value divided by one eight, the expected, or you can say actual plus abnormal. See now it has given you 2.4. So what do you do? Normal output, you multiply by 2.4. Normal loss, you multiply by 2.4. For your see your normal loss here, you keep using your recoverable value to multiply them. Now look at the process account. Let's forget about the left-hand side because it's on change, it's the same. The right hand side, your output has been multiplied by 2.4. You have normal loss, the same thing. And your normal loss is at the scrap recoverable value. Okay, we now go to when there is an abnormal gain. When there is an abnormal gain, it means that what you are expected to gain from the process, you got more than that. So in, in, in case you are expected to get 1,800 units, you now got 1,900 or 1,850. That extra is the abnormal, abnormal gain. Okay, so what do we do? Okay.
the abnormal gain is valued as the expected outputs. The way we calculate the expected normal expected outputs, that is how we value abnormal gain or abnormal loss. Okay, so now let's look at an example. Now you have a normal loss of 200, quite all right. You were expecting 1,800 1, liters, but you got more, 1,850. That means 50 is abnormal gain. Your material and process costs give you four five. Still, you will still use the expected amount, 1,800. And so your cost per liter of, of output is 2.5. So what do you do? The output is valued at 2.5. Abnormal gain is valued at 2.5. You see your loss, abnormal loss, there is no recoverable value. The difference between abnormal gain and abnormal loss is that abnormal loss is put in the right hand, in the left hand side of the account. And so it will increase the cost. That is the only thing it does. But your output, you multiply by 2.4, is it 2.4 or 2.5? 2.5, okay? No problem. When there is a scrap value for abnormal loss, yeah, abnormal gain, the scrap value is normally recovered and the scrap value is removed from the total process cost to find the cost of good outputs. Like as we see here, the scrap value is removed. We get this 4320 and everything is divided by 18. And here we have 24, which we use that 24 to value the output and value the abnormal gain. While your normal loss will continue to have its recoverable value. And so this is how the account is going to be like. Your normal gain is here. Your, normal, your abnormal gain is here, your normal loss is here. So you see, there's no time you can get abnormal loss and abnormal gain in one account. So this is summary for part one here. We've looked at process costing. We've looked at when there is no loss, no gain. No loss, no gain. What you put in is what you got out. Fine. That's straightforward. We now looked at when there is abnormal loss. Then, sorry, when there is a normal loss, we are expecting a particular output. We now saw how we value the normal loss. If there is no recovery, the normal loss is valued at zero. When there is a recovery, scrap value, the normal loss is valued at the scrap value. Then we now looked at the principle of abnormal loss. When there is an abnormal loss, we value the abnormal loss at the cost of good production. And the same thing, when there is an abnormal gain, we value the abnormal gain at the cost of good production. So you see, we've touched the following. So this is the point we've touched. We've touched when we've dealt with normal loss, abnormal loss and abnormal gain. Now the next thing we want to do is when there is closing work in progress, how do we deal with it? Then when there is 
opening work in progress. How do we deal with it? There are two methods of dealing with it. Then when there is work in progress and losses. So we have opening work in progress, closing work in progress, normal loss, abnormal loss, or perhaps abnormal gain. We may not be able to take that tonight, but let's see what we can do about opening work in and um, closing work in progress. Then we can see whether we we'll take one of the opening work in progress and then work with it. Okay, we'll now go to part two of process costing. Now this is today's lecture. The part one we did was supposed to be yesterday's lecture, which didn't hold. So enter today's lecture. Process cost with closing work in progress. Now sharing out process cost between finished and unfinished inventory. When manufacturer manufacturing is a continuous process, we find out that there may be unfinished work in progress at the start of a period or at the end of a period. Of course, at the end of period one, we have work in progress. That will be the work in progress at the start of period two. Now this section will look at closing work in progress. In all examples which are used in this session, it is assumed that there is no opening work in progress. So we're not dealing with only closing work in progress. Although we know that closing work in progress in this period will be opening in the next period, but we're not dealing with just closing in this period. This means that some units have been started in the year and we finished them in this year. It also means that there are some who started the race this year, but are yet to be finished as at the end of the year. And so at this point, they have some percentages of conversion done on them. But somehow the materials must have been fully utilized. But the labor in them, the conversion in them has not been fully utilized. The cost of process, the costs, the total process costs would have to be shared between these two class of outputs the finished goods and the unfinished work in progress. We're gonna look at a fair way in which we'll share them. In part one, we learned that we we'll divide the process cost by the expected number of outputs in order to get the cost per unit. That is what we did when there is no closing work in progress. But now that we have a closing work in progress, we need to change things a little. We do what we call equivalent units. Equivalent unit means one finished goods. Okay, it means that one or how many work in progress is equal to one finished output. It means it might be so you might be surprised that perhaps three work in progress is equal to one finished goods. Let's illustrate this. We have 200 units that are 50% complete. What does it mean? It means that these 200 units that are 50% complete, 
is equivalent to 100 completed products. Because if you say 200 times 50%, it will give you 100. So it means 200 work in progress, 50% work in progress is equal to 100 finished goods. Equivalent, not even equal, equivalent to 100 finished goods. Let's assume we have 400 units and they are 20% complete. It's as good as saying there are 80 equivalent complete goods. And so that is how we do our equivalent units. So cost are shared between finished goods in inventory, finished goods and this work in progress by calculating a cost per equivalent unit. So now what we normally do in when there was no equivalent unit, we usually say, what is the total process cost? And you divide it by the number of units. But now what we are doing is that we are going to look at the whole total process. Then we are going to look at costs per equivalent unit. So we use that cost of equivalent unit. So we are going to use equivalent units to divide the total cost to get cost by equivalent unit. So the difference here is the first one we have been doing in part one, we use the finished goods expected. And so what we are getting is cost of good outputs, cost of goods finished output. But in this case, we are having mixed output, finished good output and um, unfinished goods work in progress. That's why we now use the equivalent method to get instead of normal unit expected, we are having equivalent units. We use the process cost to divide by equivalent unit to get cost of cost per equivalent unit. Now, in this case, you are going to be distinguishing it between material and conversion. So the essence of distinguishing material and conversion is two reasons. One, we want to track how many material we put in the beginning and we are harvesting at the end. And secondly, when there is work in progress, we've been able to get the costs per equivalent unit for material, cost per equivalent unit for conversion. Okay, in all previous examples, a cost per unit was calculated by dividing total process costs by expected number of units. That's what we've been saying. The existence of work in progress complicates this because the work in progress might be complete to different degrees of different cost inputs. Now, that's the complication. Material may be 100% complete or maybe 80% complete. Maybe labor might be 80%. Other elements of conversion might have different percentage. So if there are different percentages of cost inputs, you must find their equivalent costs for each cost element. All right, so let's see the three stage we are going to be using. One, you have to prepare a statement of equivalent units to calculate the equivalent units. You do that for each of the cost elements. Next, you prepare a statement of cost per equivalent unit for each type of cost. And finally, you prepare a statement to calculate the cost of finished outputs and closing work in progress from the equivalent unit. We are gonna take an example from this and we'll only be doing closing work in progress today so that I don't complicate your head with closing and opening. Like I said before, 
we are going to have another class where we shall just treat the opening work in progress and perhaps recap this closing work in progress. Okay. The following information relates to production process X. We have input quantities here, 4,000. Completed outputs, we have 3,000. Mind you, we are not thinking about loss. There is no process loss here. Input is 4,000. What has been fully completed is 3,5. 500 is not yet complete. It's a closing work in progress. And we are told all the direct material are added to the production at the beginning of the process. Closing inventory of 500 units therefore is 100% complete for materials because inside these 500 units, all the materials have been added. So we have 100% material here, but only 40% is complete for conversion. We are told that cost incurred in the period, the direct material that you use, this is the amount you bought it. The conversion so far for the, both the 3,500 that you've done so far and the 500 that you've not finished, you spent 74. Required, prepare the statement of equivalent units. Then we'll also prepare the process account. So let's solve it here on page 23. Now look at the solution. We said our finished output, normally our input is 4,000, but what have we finished is 3,5. So this 3,5, is what has finished, 500 is work in progress. Now, can you see the cost elements here for work in progress? We have material, we have conversion. And so we put it here again, material and conversion as heading. Look at the percentage of completion. So this finished output, you have three, five finished. 100% material is there. So 3.5 total is the same as 3.5 equivalent for material. 3.5 finished is the same 100% complete for conversion. So it's the same 3.5 finished for conversion. Now let's go to 500 work in progress for material is 100%. So this 500 here is as good as 500 here, but for labor is 40%. So you look for 40% of 500, which is 200. So it means when you add the equivalent unit for material, you have three five plus five, which is 4,000. For conversion, you have three five plus 200, which is three seven. This, is your statement of equivalent costs, equivalent units. So it means 4,000 complete units is, uh, sorry, it means 4,000 material is 4,000 finished goods. So they are 100% complete. 3,700 units for labor is equivalent to 4,000 units of uh, total production, because here is only 40% labor that has been applied to 200, to the 500 work in progress. Now look at the statement of costs. The statement of cost means 
for the direct material, for the direct material, your total cost was 2004. And your conversion was 74. And here we have it 24 and 74. Then your equivalent unit material was 4,000, conversion was 37. And so when you divide, 24 divided by 4 will give you 6. 7, 4 divided by 3, 7 will give you 2. It means that the cost per equivalent unit is 6 naira for material, conversion is 2 naira. So if you want to va value finished goods, the finished goods is 3,500. It has both material, which is 6 naira, and it has both labor. Both of them completely finished. So six plus two is eight. Eight naira multiplied by 3.5 will give you 28. Now going to the finished goods, you have 500 units for material, which is this. Valued at how much? Six naira. Then 200 units for labor and others, conversion valued at two naira. So that's what is here. So 3,000 plus four will give you three, four. So this three, four is your cost by equivalent unit. So this three, four is your cost of work in progress. Your 28 is your cost of finished goods. So look at the process account again. Your direct material input is 4,000. This is what you spend on them. Conversion, you have no units here. This is what you spend on conversion. So 4,000 imputed, 31,400 costs. Your finished goods is 3,5 and you value them at 28,000. Your work in progress is 2,5 and valued at 3,004. When you do that, your account will balance both two sides, the left-hand side and the right-hand side. Now, our next class, we'll be looking at work in progress for opening. We'll be treating the FIFO and the weighted average method. Why I don't want to teach it now, it might make you forget what we just did in closing work in progress. So I don't want you to forget the closing work in progress. I want you to look at closing work in progress, how we've just treated it. Master it. Master the other ones, the abnormal loss, the normal loss, the abnormal gain. And now we are using closing work in progress. I wanted to master them so that we will add the opening work in progress and join it with losses. Point now, I want to end the class. If you have any question, please send it to the WhatsApp group. I'll be happy to take them. I will say thank you so much for coming. And please keep reading. You have um, today's Tuesday exactly two weeks to write your exams. Everything we tell you here in class, take them seriously. We'll be, as we are solving, we'll be talking about things you need to do in class. So practice these questions, practice past question papers as much as possible. I will advise you go to Google, to Google out some questions and see how certain things is being done. And practice, practice, practice you become proficient in the exam. Thank you so much. And I'll thank the network too for being friendly today. Unlike yesterday when the network was somehow. I'll tell you when the next class for the rescheduled MI class will be so that this week we'll just finish this process costing. Then next week, 
you enter into something very important and then you'll be prepared to write your exams. Do have a nice day today and be good. Read well, sleep well, get enough rest. See you in the next class. Bye.